you want me to add UBD? Yes, please. I uh, just put Gabriel uh, UBD. I would take away the yit <laughs> It's complicated. Great, everyone. I'll start in um, in about a minute or so. Okay. All right, hello everyone and welcome uh, to the second segment of our fall 2022 Southeast Asia in Transition webinar series. Uh, this series is generously sponsored by the Henry Luce Foundation and it's hosted by three universities, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, Michigan State University and Chiang Mai University. Um, magandang umaga, magandang hapon, at magandang gabi sa ating lahat. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us uh, from around the world. Uh, my name is Alisa Paredes. I'm assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of Anthropology, and it's my pleasure to be serving as today's moderator. Um, so in this session, just to give everyone um, a little bit of an outline of how we're going to proceed, um, in this session, we're going to be discussing the theme of development through roads and land. Um, we'll begin by welcoming our four panelists in turn, um, and they will say a few things about themselves and their research and their advocacy. I'll open the floor. Um, I'll open with a Q&A um, with some questions to kickstart our discussion. And then we'll open the floor to the audience, um, all of you who are joining us, um, for to, to, to voice your questions as well. So please take notes as we go along uh, and feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A uh, and in the chat at any point. Um, just a little heads up, we're gonna be ending, uh, before we end the, the our session for today, we're gonna be asking, uh, we'd like to ask you all to please complete a survey uh, this will help um, our organizers uh, um, enhance their programming and keep offering awesome events like this uh, in the future. Um, so we're very excited to be to have this um, to be having this discussion with you all today, and thank you all so much for joining us. Um, without further ado, allow me to welcome our first panelist, um, Dr. Mike Dwyer, who is assistant professor of geography at Indiana University. Mike. Great. Um, thanks, Elisa. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I will kick this off. Um, let's see. So um, I have been working in uh, mainland Southeast Asia with a focus on Laos, but a little bit of dabbling as I got pulled into Cambodia as well. Um, I feel like my research is a pretty good fit for tonight's theme of um, development, land, and roads. Um, most of the time when I introduce myself, I say I work on land governance and land politics. Um, yeah. And um, one of the things that I've gotten pulled into is thinking more and more about roads. Um, and this was largely at the, I think, the invitation of uh, some folks uh, who I was working with the, at the University of Colorado a couple of years ago, um, who were part of a, pro a project that's called China Made um, that was looking at um, Chinese infrastructure um, around the world, but in particular around Asia and around Southeast Asia. And so part of what I started doing through that project was to sort of rethink the land story that I'd been telling um, for maybe 10 years or so um, through the le through uh, basically as a road story instead. Um, and so I wanted to show a couple of photos, um, a couple of maps um, by way of introduction and sketch out, I think, two themes that I think uh, would be my opening comments, I guess, uh, for the session. Um, so let me pull up my screen here. Um, and so what you can see here um, is the corner of Northwestern Laos where I've been doing ethnographic field work um, for, I don't know, getting on 15 years. Um, the, the, the way that roads and land intersect are through this road that is uh, called different names. Uh, in Laos, it's called National Road 3. On the map here, it's shown as uh, the Northern Economic Corridor. And that Northern Corridor um, is part of a geographical imaginary that I'll talk about in uh, a minute or two. Um, but this road 
really drew my attention. I didn't initially go to Laos uh, to study road building or even land issues in the north, um, but I got kind of pulled north while I was waiting for permission to try to go some and do something else. Um, and that ended up turning into my field site. Um, and the district of Vieng Pukha that you can see uh, in the inset map here is sort of the interior of the border province that is the, uh, you could say the, the gateway to, to both China and Myanmar um, from Northern Laos, um, but it's an interior province. And so a lot of what has happened there in the last 15 or 20 years has been a result of this connectivity via this Northern Economic Corridor Road. When I was doing my field work, um, I, when I first went there in 2005, it looked like this. Um, and this was not a brand new road, but this was um, a widening and a straightening project uh, that was basically developing an old caravan trail that had then turned into an old military road and logging roads at various points um, into something that is now paved. Um, and it looked like this during the, you could say the construction mitigation phase. And by the time I was leaving, it was this very nice straighter two lane road, um, still very much through mountainous terrain. Um, but in ways that shortened the trip through Northwestern Laos from sometimes impossible, um, sometimes a day, uh, sometimes more than a day to about three to four hours um, uh, to get from the Chinese border to the Thai border. Um, the, so along this road and the thing that I was studying um, were the development of rubber plantations um, by Chinese companies who were invited into the region right around the same time that the road was built by the Lao government. Um, and there was some pretty heavy debates about what form these plantations should take. They weren't necessarily supposed to be large company plantations, um, but there was essentially a fight over whether these plantations would be large concessions or smallholder friendly contract farming schemes. And so part of what I was studying uh, and figuring out is which went where and why. Um, so this is a, a larger one. This is what it looked like when I went back a couple of years ago in 2018. This is what it, oh, sorry, this is a typo, first typo in my slides. Um, this is what it looked like in 2008 <laughs> uh, when I first started working there. Um, and when the land was being cleared uh, and newly planted in rubber. Uh, this is one of the kinds of advertising signs that you see um, along the roads. One, one of the things that I work on in research, and I hope I'll get to talk about this more later in the session, is um, the, the problems with maps and advertisements that sort of tell you that there's a project there, but don't actually tell you what's going on. Um, and so I have a lot of pictures of things like this that say, we're doing development, um, but that's all we're going to tell you. Um, so the first theme that uh, I wanted to mention as, as my opening comment is the notion of a spatial imaginary and the, the way that roads in particular fill, uh, fit into that. Um, this road, uh, as I mentioned, is called the Northern Economic Corridor. That term itself comes from the Asian Development Bank promoted GMS or Greater Mekong Subregion um, that's operationalized here in this map uh, that you'll see multiple versions of, um, but that really sort of thinks about um, development in terms of enhancing connectivity and uh, imagined a whole bunch of different corridors um, before the ones that have actually been built. Um, but this is uh, this section in Laos was built between say 2002 and seven or so. Um, and it was sometimes called the last section of the London to Singapore highway because it's actually difficult to drive <laughs> through uh, much of interior Southeast Asia, but this was a way that you could do it if you really wanted to do it. Um, this road has also been pulled into the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, China's BRI that was announced in 2013 um, and sort of illustrates the one of the things that scholars have been saying about the BRI now for a couple of years, which is that it's partly new infrastructure, but it's partly enrolling things that were happening already. Um, and so this, the, this corridor is sort of part of both this, uh, both of these imaginaries. Um, oops, losing my screen. I thought I'd put um, another imaginary. This is a much earlier imaginary. This is a Cold War imaginary um, that comes out of uh, a RAND Corporation report that was published in 1972. And all I'll say about it for right now um, is that there are no roads at all. Um, and so this will, uh, I think, speak a little bit to this notion that roads are what brings development, but this was very, connectivity um, in this interior of Northern Laos has been a political issue for a very long time. Um, and this is not the beginning of it, but this is sort of an interesting middle point in, uh, in that history. 
second theme I wanted to mention um, was the notion of land as vulnerability um, in the sense that when you have new roads um, that are coming in, it changes the social relations of the land that surrounds them um, because it changes the economics of plantation development, of cash cropping, um, of real estate, of everything that, uh, that, that, that can be accessed with roads and used by roads. Um, I'm going to see if I can get rid of my OneDrive badge. Of course, it has to update right now. Um, and so the, the image that I'm starting with here is from the mitigation program that was rolled out as part of the Asian Development Loan, Asian Development Bank loan that uh, helped build part of the road and that governed uh, the impacts of the road along its duration all the way through Northern Laos. And what you can see here is that most of this mitigation work was within 50 meters of the center line of the road. Very little of it stemmed into what project developers called the impact zone of the road itself, which stretched for multiple kilometers outside the road um, and included things like the rubber plantations that I showed you before. Um, and so this notion of land as vulnerability really comes out of this mismatch between the impacts of new road corridors, and which is fairly large, and the um, resources that developers are usually willing to put into um, preventing or trying to at least preventatively mitigate some of the negative impacts that they know are gonna come with the road. Um, so that's, I think that's where I'll leave it. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Um, there's already so much to think about there. And I always I always love looking at a good map. Uh, I know that a number of you probably, I'm, I'm thinking that a number of you share that, uh, share that with me as well. Uh, so thank you for that, Mike. Um, and next we'll have Dr. Lisa Aronson, who's assistant professor at the Un Institute of Asian Studies at the University of Brunei Dar es Salaam. Thank you, Elisa. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I am a social anthropologist by training, and I now focus mostly on environmental history and post-war landscapes. And I'm also going to share some slides. And in my five minutes, I'm mostly going to tell you two stories um, and maybe leave most of my theorizing, such as it is, for later. So let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. So. My field site is Punam Gulen, which is a national park. It is also the home of nine villages, which you can see in small black writing on the map. And it's also one of the most sacred sites in Buddhist Cambodia. Um, and for a very long time, you can't actually see it on this map, but the, um, the green line is the boundaries of the national park and the circle that I have in the bottom right hand corner shows the major villages where my stories are going to take place. Um, and since the colonial period, there's only been one road up and down the mountain for wheeled vehicles. Um, otherwise, there was just footpaths up and down various parts of the steep slopes. So the old road between the villages was extremely difficult, particularly in rainy season, um, and mostly traversed by motorbikes. Um, and if a car, only four wheel drive. And there was only one main road that tourists would come in and out to come up and down the mountain. But around five years ago, a cross plateau highway began construction that is not only trying to improve the long term entrance road, but it's also made entrance up the back of the mountain, which is where the major district capital is. Um, so I, for me, the road sort of came into long-term research that I've been doing of the social and environmental history of the plateau. And Phnom Kulen is quite well known in Cambodia as a sacred site. Um, but I've been more interested in sacred geography than sort of the secular road, but the two come together quite interestingly in my recent research. So if you think of the mountain of Phnom Kulen as a sacred site, it's important to recognize that people don't think that every step you take falls on sacred ground. So some sacred sites are clearly known <coughs> and visible, but there's other places that are unseen where there's powers or spirits or non-humans. And those sites might be unknown until someone steps on them and becomes ill or ties a hammock across them and sleeps there or swings an ax into a tree. And so this road project has 
cut across a lot of domains on the mountain. And by doing that, it has revealed some of the forces that had been unseen underneath the earth. So this photograph by a photographer friend of mine shows the east side of the road, which is this is the first time in recorded history that there's been vehicle access coming up the east side of the plateau. Um, so this used to be just a trail up and down the cliffs that people would walk. So the roadworks took oh, almost four years, and they included widening the old road by dynamiting bulldozers and, uh, sorry, dynamiting boulders and bulldozing trees. Um, because the construction was so long term, both local people and outsiders used the road while the construction was ongoing for those years. Um, and from a sort of economic development perspective, the road project was fairly equitable in that it did have local youths from the villages participated in making the roads when they went through the villages. And most of the youth who participated were the same youth who often migrate to Thailand during certain seasons. Um, so what I'm going to talk about briefly is that accidents that happened during construction in this period here. And I'm just going to talk about two accidents very briefly. Um, this is a Google Earth from the backside of the mountain. So the, the curvy swiggly line going up is actually coming up the east side of the plateau. And what happened in 2019 is that a minivan with tourists, Chinese tourists being brought to the sacred site, it came up the backside of the mountain, which was not actually open to tourists. And the minivan swerved and rolled on one of the sharp curves in the road. And there was a number of injuries and several deaths. Um, and you can see on the right how steep that road was at that point. It's still that steep, but um, this is before it was tarmacked. So if you know about ideas about mountains in Cambodia, um, there's ideas that there's often great Naga that sleep underneath the earth, Naga being Niak in Khmer. And a medium was brought to the site of the accident to interpret why this accident had happened. And in the ceremony, it was revealed that there had been a Naga sleeping coiled beneath the earth in a great cave, and that this new construction site, this newly cut road, had cut quite closely to the top of the Naga's den. So when the vehicle swerved off the edge of the road, it had actually struck the sleeping Naga, who rolled in protest, and then the van itself rolled. So what local people did is they made offerings of propitiation, they erected a small spirit shrine on the site, and the Naga and the forces associated with it were asked to please relocate away from the road somewhere deeper underneath the mountain. So in this example, you see sort of the modern technology actually literally knocked against the idea of the cosmological landscape and, these, and disturbed this more than human force. Um, but inversely, the second thing I want to briefly mention is the first accident which had fatalities for local villagers, and that was on the 1st of January 2020. And it was a local villager who was drunk, was driving, and struck a woman on a motorbike coming back from the only clinic on the mountain. It was a terrible accident in which both the mother and one of two twin boys um, died at the time, and two children remained alive. So villagers were very, very upset and hurt and shaken by this accident. And a few days after it took place, um, initially monks were brought in to pray for the souls of the dead and to try to help their spirits find their way home. But then a few days later, villagers decided that they needed a spirit guardian for the road. So I have a few photos of the ceremony. You can see here that construction was still going on in the background, even as the ceremony happened on the road. Villagers made a new spirit shrine and the most powerful medium on the mountain, Yangam. She's in the bottom left hand of the corner holding the candles. She was invited to come into a trance state and people asked an ancient wild spirit that came to her if it would become a tame spirit and live in the spirit house and protect people from the dangers of the new road. And they renamed the spirit who was said to be have been a, a powerful uh, military general back in ancient times. And they asked him to take the name grandfather safety, Tasok, and to protect the people 
who passed on the road. And the shrine remains. It was put on the stump of a large cut gulen tree, a lychee tree, which is put on gulen is named after the lychee. And people will make incense and offerings as they pass by on the side of the road. So to me, this was a very interesting, um, I'll stop screen sharing, a very interesting thing because in a way the road was being sort of domesticated or brought into the sacred tree. Um, I have not stopped sharing. Okay, I stopped sharing, right? Yes, okay. <laughs> so I think that's all I'll say for right now. Um, it was very interesting for me to how different these two interactions with uh, more than human or non-human creatures on the mountain were for local people. Um, people said they liked the road. Nobody was protesting the building of the road. However, when things like this happened, a lot of interpretive work went into understanding what had happened between that infrastructure project and the long-standing uh, non-human forces on the mountain. So I'll stop there for now. That was really provocative. Thank you so much, Lisa, for transporting us to those, to you know, to sharing that that's those stories with us and transporting us to that a very special place. I'm, I'm inter so interested in in what you experienced there, what you saw there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, the third speaker um, that we'll have for today is uh, Chi Suichan Patanap Paiwan, who is professor of geocultural management at Bodhi Vijalaya College and Srina Karin Rirot University in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, Chi, thank you so much for joining us here and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, um, Alsa. So the couple, which of course you clear go common or get put it to the Konogadena, the Ganya Secretary of Thailand, which is a lot of Vina. So I would like to quit thing all of you in the Pagano language. Well, Bokinyo is a, <clears throat> one of indigenous people in Thailand, even though the Thai government not recognize that uh, in Thailand have indigenous people yet, but we <clears throat> insist, we confirm ourselves that uh, we are the indigenous people. <clears throat> so um, as uh, Alsa already introduced me, so um, I would like to introduce myself more as uh, I'm, I'm uh, Indigenous people, uh, we call ourselves as a Pogakanyo. No. But the European people, especially the British, call us as a Korean. No. Thai people call us as a Korean. Uh, Myanmar or Burmese call us as a Kijin. And then the people in the indigenous people around uh, the north of Thailand and then the south of uh, China call us as a Nyang. So those of name, we don't understand the meaning at all. We try to ask that, uh, what the meaning that you name us, but no one can answer. But we understand only what your meaning, that is mean human being, people or human being. That is mean our ancestors have the point of view that we are the same dignity of human being. Uh, um, like a equal with other people. We are not higher than anyone and we are not lower than anyone. We are the same level of human dignity. So actually I I am um, announced myself in the Thai society or anywhere that I'm not real academic. I'm, I am a indigenous people, I call it arc activist, activist. So it's mixed like three things. Some feel I also become uh, academic, like a, because of I have to. Somehow I'm be like a artist because of I have to. Sometimes I also be like a activist. So at activist, no, this is a this is a my define myself as a. So uh, you might uh, you might not. Uh, um, how to say the and you mind you unsatisfied with my presentation as an academic level, but I will I will um share the story, the information to all of you with the the reality, you no, know, something like that. So, what I would like to share today because of my few, uh, can, can I share my screen? So, this is um what I would like to 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 share with 
uh, all of you today is uh, when the big snake come to the traditional chicken land, what happened? Because um, you can see in the in in the previous long time ago, as we call we we define ourselves as an indigenous people. So I remember when I was young, the road in my community be like a foot road, but later on it's become to bicycle road, and then we turn to motorcycle road, and then turn to pick up road. Now it's become to like a um, highway road. So when it is come to highway road, what is changed in my community? What is the people change? What is the soil change? What is the forest change? What is uh, the river change? And then what is the pollution or the air change? And what is our uh, spirit is changed? So this is uh, what, um, what uh, I would like to share with you. Um, I uh, my my research field almost I study I start, I study about um, um, the indigenous identity identity development. So uh, actually, we focus on three dimension. The first one is a cultural or spiritual identity. The second one is a, a natural resource preservation identity and preservation and uses, use, use, using identity. And the last one is like an economic management identity because of uh, we believe that uh, our life, sustained life in our community is uh, we need like a triangle stone. If we have a tri triangle stone balance, we can put our pot and then we can, we can make a fire and then we can cook rice, we can cook um, food. So our life is stand. But if something unbalanced, if something unbalanced, one stone unbalanced, the pot will fall down. So when the big snake came to our land, what is destroy? How is destroy our triangle stone in our community? So this is a um, next section I will I will describe, I will share about. This one, and then, and you can see the the map that I show in this um this slide. <clears throat> in in our uh, indigenous people, we are almost uh, living in the north and on north and the west part of Thailand. But um, one day, one day the we call it like the mega project of the state, but it's not only Thai state. Now this. The this kind of a project is not is not like a nation project or nation state project, but this is a, like a regional, regional, um, regional make a project. No, you can see like the first map. This road is planned to from Thailand to Europe, so it's past indigenous uh, community, especially in the in the Tat or Mahong Son area in 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 the north and south part. They said that. They're gonna use this road to connect to Europe. You know? um, the second one, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the the train rail. No? is a uh, connect from Bangkok to the southern part more and more. No, no, even though now no train rail to our community yet, but they have planned to connect it. And then the third one you can see, I think is uh, this map you can see with the. Uh, um, um the presentation of uh um i think mike already present about the uh east west economic corridor in southeast asia you can see from vietnam to myanmar but it's cross it's cross thai thai thailand area and then especially the north part and the south part uh, the, the west part is uh, is uh, almost in the indigenous community and then <clears throat> also Actually, in small village or small small district district in Thailand, you won't see airport or you won't see international airport. But here in Mesot, it's a quite small small district, but now it's became to international airport. So they would like to connect to other country around Southeast Asia, around Asia, and to Europe too. So 
you can imagine. So what gonna happen in our community, and then what we gonna face or confront with the the challenge, you know. But um, the the big thing is uh, in the the current point of view, they compare the road as a snake, as a snake, because they said that even though in the previous, then they cannot imagine that how big the road gonna happen in a community, but they imagine that one day the big snake will come to our community. And then they're going to swallow traditional chicken land. So we are at an indigenous people. We are not wild chicken. We are traditional chicken. We are not immigrant from other place. We are living here long time since our ancestor more than thousand years. So we are real traditional chicken. So when the big snake come, this is uh, the thing we happen. So what it happened? So next section I will describe. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Chi. I'm really, I'm really intrigued by those powerful metaphors and how the metaphors become material. Maybe we can bring that out further in in the discussion. Uh, but thank you so much for starting us off with that. Um, finally, I'd like to welcome Gabrielle Yong Yit Bui, who is lecturer in the Geography, Environment, and Development Department at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Brunei Dar es Salaam. Gabrielle, uh, thanks for joining us, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share. Uh, as a um, I've been, I'm a Bruneian, so I live in Brunei, I'm from Brunei, I'm second generation migrant. So from the second generation migrant population. So I, my main area of interest is in sustainable development. So I'm, I come from earth science and I study environmental issues. So one of the big problems in Brunei is that Brunei is a very young nation, just became a full nation state in 1984. So we are very young nation. And so very, at the very early stage of development. So through my, through my life, going through from my childhood, I've seen, I mean, I've experienced the world where roads was not well developed and took, takes a long time to go from one, one part to, of the country to another. So going across to Miri, which is the place that we normally go, takes about 40 minutes to cross. Uh, you know, when I was young, we had to go by the beach because there was no roads. So this is, the, this is the reality of uh, Bu uh, Brunei and Borneo. So most of my study is uh, restricted to Brunei and Borneo, mainly because as a Bruneian, I was very interested to, I, I am very interested to understand what are the barriers, why, why, uh, why what is making it so difficult for the country to, to develop <laughs> into a modern uh, nation state. Uh, you know, when we have people studying overseas, most for four, four or five generations of Bruneians going mainly to the UK, and yet uh, development is still mainly thwarted by all kinds of issues and problems. So the what I want to share today comes mainly from three groups of studies, three areas of study. And in our work on to try to understand sustainability, uh, we had to try to understand the historical context. And so we do a lot of historical geographical studies to try to reconstruct historical geography for over a decade. And the other, the other part is that over the last four years or so, we were involved in an ecotourism development project in the southern border of the country, just bordering Sarawak. This is with a group of indigenous uh, Iban community. Now, indigenous is indigenous to Borneo, but the Ibans are not uh, Bruneians. Yeah, most of them come mainly from the other, the western and southern part of Borneo, but move to the eastern part to our area. No, sorry, the north northwestern part. We always call it eastern, but the north the northwestern part of Borneo, and they cross the border without knowing. So they cross the border without knowing that they're in Brunei. So they, they eventually found out that they were in Brunei and these particular groups, most Ibans in Brunei are not 
Brunei are not regarded as Bruneians. They are not regarded as citizens of Brunei. They are mainly Sarawakians. But this group was made, you know, was uh, made Brunei citizens. So anyway, we learn a lot from our time spent with the Iban community. Now, as a Bruneian, I have got a lot of Iban friends from young, and I have been in the forest from, from my younger days. But in the ecotourism development project, we learn a lot about how the indigenous view rose. Now, and finally, we also did a project a few years ago on the road networks in Borneo. How there have been a, a project, an ASEAN project, to try to connect uh, or develop a pan Borneo highway just to link all the states around Borneo. Now, just a little background on Borneo, just, just to paint the picture. I don't have slides, but you know, it's difficult to get people to understand the, the rainforest. The rainforest is very dense and they are mainly on slopes, on highlands. So when you see those tall trees with the big canopies, very damp, dust uh, and, and beam quite dark in the forest, uh, it is, the undergrowth is not that dense, but it's not easy to traverse the land. And in any low lying area, it's very swampy. It is extremely difficult to make roads. But what we found from our historical study, historical geography study, and from the indigenous is that people do not need roads. It is difficult. Uh, they do not need roads, first of all, because they don't need to transport a lot of things. What they can transport are just something in a, in a bag. <laughs> and that's it. They walk through the land. And they do not need to make roads. So the only roads that you have among the indigenous people are just a few trails around their settlement. So there are, there are indigenous groups who are nomadic, but quite a, a lot of them settle by the river banks because the river is the main transport highway. Yeah? So the indigenous population of Borneo Island, it's dense for us, uh, there are many ethnic groups. So collectively referred to as Dayaks by the British. They don't call themselves Dayaks, but it is the, the Westerner who call them everyone a Dayak. So the Dayaks is not the only group of people who live in, who live in Borneo. Around the coast, there are many kingdoms. So these are mostly Malay kingdoms settled from the region, set, establishing their kingdoms in Borneo. So very rich land. So they do not venture into the land. So roads is a very foreign thing to the indigenous population and even to the, the early migrants who established the kingdoms. So roads came into Borneo, Brunei, because it was introduced by the British. It was very strange. So it was something that was, uh, that was not, not natural, but because uh, the British had a very comprehensive program of transforming everything, including changing the world view, our view of the world and our culture. Uh, the indigenous population now really depends on the roads. So if, you know, roads are always seen as a, a problem in terms of uh, rainforest conservation, because when, once you build a road through a rainforest, it starts to cause fragmentation and cause environmental degradation and so on. But to the indigenous modern, roads are a must. So in the Pan Borneo Highway study, there are lots of uh, communities in the higher upper regions of the, of the river valleys. They got very upset when they are bypassed by the road, the road uh, projects. Because for, for in the modern life, roads is the way, is, it is the access to resources. It is the access to a better way of life, a better standard of living. So although once upon a time, roads are foreign and we don't need roads, but now everybody really need the roads to survive. So roads have changed everything. It has changed culture. It has changed uh, how we value things. And it's also brought in a lot of problems at the same time. So, I mean, that's just uh, what I want to share to set, set up what we, I would like to share in the discussion later on. Thank you.
That's great. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, and the rest of our panelists. I mean, I really feel like we've tackled this um, this theme um, of roads and land from multiple different angles, right? I mean, from the angles of like economic development corridors, from more than human, from a more than human perspective, from the perspective of indigenous advocacy, and also from the perspective of historical geography. I mean, I think that there's so, there's a lot of richness here, and we're seeing. Um, we're starting to see a lot of tensions and a lot of resonances start to emerge. Uh, so thank you to all of our panelists for 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 bringing those thoughts from from the, from field research um, to us all here today. Um, there's a number of questions that are um, entering already, but I think I'll go ahead and start us off with just a few questions, a few general questions to get the ball rolling. Um, and the first that the first question that I think um, is important to address. Um, is really just meant to like um, kind of unearth the implicit assumptions that we've been working with here, right? And so here's the, the first question. Um, in your context, historically, how and why exactly has this idea of development become so attached to land-based and particularly road-based infrastructures? Is anyone moved to, oh, Lisa, yes, please. I do not have a sophisticated answer. <laughs> My impression <laughs> for Cambodia is it's, it's about capitalism. Uh, roads, road-based infrastructure gets linked to the idea of roads are conduits of goods and people and therefore part of economic growth. Um, and that's, I think, how they get sort of unproblematic in plans as the idea road leads to good development, development is economic growth without thinking through perhaps other implications. Yeah. Please yeah if, I, if, if I may, uh, in another related study in historical geography, we found that, uh, you know, roads uh, is very much part of, you know, roads and roads based development is very much in a importation uh, from Western Western Europe yeah well in the days of modernization and it's very much uh, it's very closely or coupled with the introduction of the vehicle the internal internal combustion engine vehicle so roads and cars come together and that's how it was in Brunei as we trace the development of Brunei from the early days, uh, the the where I am in the western end of the country is where we found oil, and it's actually the furthest, the most remote part of the country. The capital is on the east, and 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 there were a lot more cars in the western and in the remote area just because of the the discovery of oil it, before the war. So in the nineteen thirties, forties, there were cars and roads just because it was we have a more very westernized kind of society. It's mostly British, Dutch, and mix of people and, and of course other people from the region come in to work in the area. So roads is part of the plan. So in the develop the development plan is includes roads, road networks. So when they build roads or when they have any plans, the roads is a must. And it's let the roads lead the development trajectory. And 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 be, and with this comes cars and these are feedback systems. When you have more cars, you need more roads then you need to clear more land. You cannot reach the new land without more roads. So you build more roads and you bring more cars. As the roads gets longer and, and spread out wider, you really have to depend on cars. So now we are dependent on cars. We cannot, we cannot uh, not use cars. In Brunei, everybody needs to own a car because development is so spread out that you cannot use public transport. You have to use your own cars. Otherwise, you can't get around. So roads and cars have created like in, in Bandar Sirbagawan, the, I mean, in the, you know, the Western part of, uh, the Eastern part of Brunei, which is where the capital is, more than 50 or 60% or so of the region is become urbanized. It was for us it, just 40 years ago. It's now 60% urbanized because of sprawl development. And this is one of the things that really uh, led me to think about roads is I, 
is this work, I follow the work of Paolo Solari from Arizona State University uh, very closely because, uh, and he identified road led development as the main cause of most of the environmental problem. And they all come together in, and even directly affects uh, climate change. So it is, it is roads is part and parcel of the development, the modern development plan. Unlike the Roman roads, yeah? The modern roads comes with cars. So you cannot separate the two. <laughs> I'll jump in um, and uh, can I, I wanna show a couple, couple images um, if that's okay. Um, attempting to um, pick up on uh, Elisa's question for, con for specific concrete answers. Um, so I showed this map uh, earlier, which comes from um, some US Cold War documents that are worrying about the roadlessness um, of Northern Laos um, and the Northwest in particular. And of course, that's not true. There are roads there. Um, and so the I wanted to start with that, but go to some historical maps as a way to give, I think, a, one version of a more concrete answer um, to Elisa's question, which has to do with French colonialism and the direction of travel that was possible for exporting trade goods. Um, and when the French came to Laos, they were very interested initially in accessing China. Um, they were trying to sail up, the, they were trying to navigate up the Mekong in the hopes of essentially making Phnom Penh uh, a rival to Hong Kong so they could uh, get the, you know, the, the, spite, the, the silk trade from, from Sichuan. Um, and they rapidly ran out of uh, hope when the Mekong uh, proved to be unnavigable. Um, but when they then started um, to try to imagine getting control of Laos, what they discovered was that the roads in Laos were, um, as Gabriel was saying, essentially rivers. Um, but more importantly, the rivers ran between what is now China and Thailand, and they didn't run um, southeast toward what is now Vietnam. They essentially ran from the Northeast to the Southwest. Um, and you can see um, on, on the map on the left here, this is this uh, area that on a French map from 18, I think 93 was um, contested territory, um, sort of where the, the British and the French and the Chinese uh, and the Siamese empires all um, overlapped. Um, these boundaries are, are pretty, pretty made up. Um, but uh, you can really see it on the right here. This is an 1896 map where you can see the river system ran north-south um, and really connected Thailand with, with northern China um, between the Mekong system and the northern reaches of the Chao Phraya um, was a major trade route for bringing um, trade goods, forest products, um, things from China and from Laos down essentially through, um, uh, through, through Siam and Burma um, rather than through Vietnam. Um, and so I wanted to just read a sentence that comes from the 1870s um, uh, French Mekong expedition um, where before Laos was brought as a, um, a protectorate, uh, part protectorate, part colony of, of France, um, they were imagining uh, the future. And they said, uh, this is um, the geographer who was among the Mekong exp uh, expedition is, is imagining a future French protectorate of Northern Laos. And he says, we would only ask him, the Lao, we would only ask the Lao King to favor the development of commerce toward the Southern part of the peninsula, i.e. toward um, what's now Southern Vietnam and Cambodia to help us do away with fiscal hindrances and to improve the roads in this direction. Um, so it was really sort of about the shifting of the direction of travel um, that certainly the imagining of roads um, initially took, and although it took much longer to actually build these roads. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, this is another image of, of this road, but one of the ironies of all this is that, as I mentioned, this is the Northern Economic Corridor, which is actually reconnecting this old caravan route. So it's not the sort of roads that the French imaginary, the French development imaginary was imagining, um, but it's trying to essentially connect and rehabilitate the older pre-colonial markets of the region, which re really went between Southern China and Northern Thailand. Gosh, that's really striking. Yeah, thank you for that. Chi, can, um, do you have yeah. anything else to add for us? Yeah. yeah, okay. So um, I would like to share about the, the Pocanyo or current people point of views about the road 
uh, what if the road uh, come and accept our our livelihood in in our society? So can I share this? So um, okay, I would like to start with this um, this slide. So um, you can see this one when the big snake come to our community and swallow our children. So um, we, we, in our point of views, we um, have experience and um, you don't kind of believe it, that the road or our experience is proved that because of the big snake or the big road come to our community. So they, they, it swallow our children. So now in my community, when I was young, I remember that uh, only one or two of the young people in my community who out of the community to the city, only one or two, like uh, 30 years ago. But now when my community become to like a concrete road or four lanes or six lane road, now I think only one or two who still stay in the community, except that out of community go to the city. So we talk about the 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 stomach of the snake. They said that in the stomach of the snake you have a lot of frog inside there, and then the sound of frog is very very loud, and then the sound of frog can attack or or stole our soul to the frog. So without frog, we cannot survive. We cannot stay anymore. So when I was young, my grandmother uh, tell me about this story. I don't understand the meaning, but now I am one of the children who get swallowed by the big snake. Now, now I go back to my motherland, my community, only twice or third time. Another time I have to stay in the city. So I'm the one who gets swallowed by, by the snake. So, but not only me, you know, 80 or 90% of my, my friends, my generation now is a uh, stay in the stomach of the, the snake. So now even I, I talk with you now, I stay in inside the frog. So I don't, I don't understand in the beginning what kind of the frog. So now the frog stole my spirit or my soul already. I would like to go back to my community. Without frog, I cannot go back. So now I sit on the car. It's like a frog. So the sound of the, the car is a, make me feel comfortable to travel, to do something now. So I cannot go to my office without frog. So frog is my life now. Frog is my soul now. So my soul is changed. But in the previous, our soul, we said that our soul is, is uh, linked with my food. So we travel with our food. We travel with uh, our, our, our heart, what we would like to go. But now we, our soul is changed to frog. So this is uh, the power of the snake. So later on, because of the snake, so the snake is not only swallow our children, but the snake also bring the white chicken come to our community. The white chicken cannot go without with, without the road. The, the road bring white chicken from Europe. The first white chicken called as a British. Another white chicken is from Chopraya rivers or from Bangkok. The name is Thai. Another white chicken is from, from another region. So they call themselves as a Buddhist. Another white chicken from America and they call themselves as a Christian or something like that. When they come, they, they, they wreck our traditional seat and replace our traditional seat to become a white chicken seat. White chicken identity, white chicken soul, white chicken spirit, why she can culture replace in our community. This is uh, the power of the road. You know, 
So, um, <clears throat> when I was young, I I believe, uh, not I believe, I remember that when I was born, my mom took my umbilical cord to the forest and dropped with one tree. That is mean my soul and the tree is connected to each other. But nowadays, when the people became to Buddhist, when they get born, the monk come to their family and do some ceremony and then just finish. Not connect to the nature anymore. Not connect to the tree anymore. Not connect to the forest anymore. The, in the same size, Christian come also did like that. So that means now our traditional seed of wisdom, our traditional seeds of knowledge that uh, keep relationship between human and human, human and nature, human and supernatural or spiritual is changed because of the road brought the white chicken come to our community. So the next one, the road also brought the giant to our community. When the giant come with the road, the giant mow the grass, then sucks our soul and spirit with them. So I remember when I was young, when um, the grass or the, the, um, the, the wheat grow in our rice field, we gathering our community member together, we work together in, in the field, we help each other. But now we don't need to help each other anymore. We can do this kind of thing. It's like a fertilizer, right? And then in the in the previous, for example, one one field, we have to work together like a 30 person in one field whole day. But now just only one hour is finished. But we have to exchange with many things. In the river, we cannot eat fish. In the river, we cannot eat frog. In the rivers, we cannot eat chill. Because of this kind of fertilization, it's not only effect on the grass, but also effect in the water. So in the people here too. So this is a, another thing that is come with the road and come with the big snake. And then when the road come, our ancestors said that one day when the road come, the big storm will blowing everything away in our community. And I, I, when I was young, I cannot imagine the storm will blowing everything. But now I realize that the big storm is already came to our community. Some big storm they call like a special economic zone. Some big storm they call like a dams. Some big storm they call like a it was economic corridor is come with the road. So, but our ancestors said that uh, if you would like to keep your own identity, if you would like to keep your life or your soul, you have to keep the plant of rice and then the light of candle. This is the two things that can protect you can fence you and then can uh, help you to survive with the storm, with the giant, with the white chicken among the big road in your community. So this is um, this is uh, the, the, the effect or the attack of the road to our community. But uh, as uh, our friend from uh, Brunei said, nowadays we cannot refuse the road to work, to travel, or to survive. But how to, how to living with the road without destroy the rice plant and the candlelight? This is uh, the challenge for us in, 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 in nowadays. Thank you. I don't know if this is an answer the question or not, but this is a, what information I would like to share. Yeah, thank you so much, Chi. Yeah, that really, for me, that really that really provokes a question that now I'm I'm really moved to, I'm really moved to ask of all of you all. Um, when she mentioned earlier that you know you said she that you you too were swallowed by the snake, 
right? You've also been swallowed by the snake. There's kind of a story of complicity here that I think that um, also emerges in a lot of the other story, a lot of the other, um, a lot of the other stories that we've heard from the other panelists, right? There's a sense that this is kind of an inevitable that development via road infrastructure is inevitable, that it's something that people do buy into, that they don't protest. You know, I mean, can you know, there's a perception of threat. There's a perception that this is um, going to bring on a kind of violence to, onto indigenous um, understandings, uh, indigenous cosmologies. Um, and yet this is something that people do participate in. And so I guess the question that I'd like to ask um, to our panelists, and you can tackle it however you like, is, um, yeah, just how and how and why do people participate? in in these projects and is it true is it in fact true that there isn't protest or is protest happening in many different forms that aren't necessarily just social mobilization and um you know how would you like to see the the idea of development um reclaimed um by us as academics by practitioners by um activists etc um, there's many different elements to that question. Please feel free to tackle them as as you'd like. Gabrielle, I'm seeing that you're like moved to 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 take to to kick us off. So please take it away. Yes, uh, I, I I just want to address that because you said uh, that the people do not protest or that we are complicit in this uh, development kind of paradigm. That's not quite accurate. As I was saying, that the colonization process involves a wholesale change of everything, right? So education, for example. So when the British uh, colonized this area, they not only uh, changed the economic uh, you know, system completely from, you know, from a nature-based uh, and trade that for Bruna to one that is on land and cut. And, and they removed three forests, a large area of forests to set up plantations and they had to build roads to these plantations. But that, that is not all they do. Coloni colonization involves, you know, education. So from young, we were told that we were backward. We are wrong. Everything we believe in is just superstition. And we were told, I was very confused when I was young, that we studied, uh, you know, history and geography, that we did not exist until we were discovered. <laughs> so <laughs> we did not exist. So until, the, until it was written in the, the English books that we were discovered. So what, so we were, I was always uh, confused. Like, did, were there nobody there in that country uh, before it was discovered by some white man? Uh, it's, always a, it's always the case. So we were educated and, and including uh, religion, of course. Yeah. So as, as uh, she was telling, she was saying that we had a lot of religion uh, missionaries coming in. Uh, both uh, you know, Muslim and first and then uh, Christian missionaries. So it changes a lot of things. So there was no protest because we were told that this is how we should, and it, they started young because we, education starts from, before that we don't go to school. So now we go to school from young and it become a must. When, you're, when your child is like five years old, you have to go to school. Education for all. Everything is seen as a good thing. So people send their kids to school. Uh, they can't work in the fields. They send them to school because it is the right thing to do. We were told that it is right. And everyone is, everyone is, the mind is just formed to follow. That's why there is no protest. You can't say it's complicit because, you know, if no one really have any other views. In the early days of colonialism, of the colonization of the area, like say in Borneo, there were a few like uh, warrior uh, chiefs, yeah, who would try to fight, uh, fight back, but they were all defeated because you know, guns and cannons and so on. So they 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 were dead. They were removed very quickly, and everybody just go into the education system, and eventually to we have to live in a world where we need money. Before that, we live off the land. And now we need money. And so you need to get jobs. And the jobs are created in the cities as part of development. So you have to be part of the system. So you have no way. You have no way of uh, living outside the system. So in our, our experience with the Iban people, 
only the very old ones, you know, they, they would like to go back to the, the long house in the, you know, in the remote area. But almost everyone else under the age of, you know, 50 and below, they prefer to live in the city. And for the young generation, 30 or below, they have no concept, no idea of life outside of the urban world. So they want to travel, they want to work in, in high tech, IT, that kind of thing. Nobody, they want fancy cars. Nobody wants to live off the land in the forest. It's just because of development, education. We, education promotes one, kind, one paradigm. That's it. Everyone now assumes that this is the reality. Right. I really like how you're bringing out that nuance, right? There's a, there's a difference between a lack of protest and complicity. Yes. And you're raising the, you know, the issues of like, um, uh, yeah, just like a, a paradigm, an educational paradigm that's come yeah. along with the colonial experience yeah. um, that is responsible for that. Yes, yeah. is anyone else, would anyone else like to add their thoughts to this? Uh, uh, can I can I can I add something about the this kind of question? Um, uh, as a as a indigenous people, in the beginning when the road uh appear in uncommitted, um, who bring the road? Who made the road? They have the reason to make the road our committee. They say that because of we love you. Because of we love you, we. We uh, we would like to involve. We would like to include you, belong to us. Mm -hmm. So we connect you with the road. Sound is good. Sound is good. So our ancestors or our indigenous people still confusing, still confused at that period. That because one day you be indigenous people, you have authority in your in your ancestral land, right? You speak in your own language, but one day you discover that, oh, this land is not belong to you anymore. This land, it belongs to the state. This land had an, another owner. So yes. you belong to other people. So what kind of rights do you have? Because now the, the cultural, cultural right, you, you cannot use. Cultural tabulation, cultural regulation, you cannot use in your own land anymore. They have another kind of a, regulation, another kind of uh, tabulation they call as a law to, to work with you. So when our ancestors are confused, when the road comes, they have no idea to react, to respond. So that time, no one to protest. Or you love me, or you like me, or you include me. OK, let's let, let, let do it. But later on, when we, we discover that uh, the thing that uh, our ancestors tell us, warning us in the previous now is uh, happen now is uh, uh, appear as a reality we understand the signal or the symbolic of the of the our ancestor might that tell us in the previous we just think that this is a kind of might or this is a fox theory fox, fox tale story but now we know that it's not folk tale story it's kind of a coach it's an code that our ancestor would like to put in our in our memory, in our mind, to be careful about the wild chicken or something like that. So we, when we know exactly the the effect of the wild chicken activity or the wild chicken characteristic in our community, we start to learn about how to refuse, how to reject. Reject, we are not reject to to how to say it to broken the relationship with the other people or we are not reject to uh reject to the the mainstream or to the other society we are not we don't want to stay, stay alone or let get left behind but we would like to to uh, receive the thing that came and then support us and strengthen us and we would like to reject the thing that come and destroy or, or how to say it, um, um, destroy or, or make us have more weakness in our life. So that's why now we, before the, the, any project came to our community, we try to use our rights as a, as a state citizen 
So we know more because of education. As a, our brother Gabriel said, education because of the road. So we got education. When we got education, we know more what we should do. We know more what we should not do. So we know more what we have rights and what we have responsibility to do. So now we try to use full of our rights and full of responsibility as a indigenous people, as a state citizen to reject and mm -hmm. receive what is good for us, what is bad mm -hmm. for us. So many, many projects, many road they would like to do in our community, but we try to protest. We try to refuse, we try to reject with art activity, with academic activity and with activist activity too. So for example, with activist activity, we also, um, we also, um, how do you say it? We also work on the, work on the road. We use the roads as a tool for protest. We work from our community to the, the, the parliament. We work from our community to the uh, mm -hmm. province governor to propose them that are, uh, please stop this kind of road because now they, they would like to make a new road as a, they would like to build the cave, the cave road. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if you understand or not, the cave road and then no. like underground road. For mm -hmm. us, we said that it's not necessary because the road now is enough. It's already available. It's already convenience for our life. So we <coughs> don't need more and more. <coughs> if you build more and destroy our rivers, if you make more, it destroy our mountain. If you make more, it destroy our forest. It we see that it's not necessary, not necessary to to do more. Yeah. Now it's still okay. So um, we use the rose to protest, and then for the uh, for the art art artists, uh, we also um like a compose the song, or we we have the events to to uh, advocate or campaigns to stop the project or something like that. For the academic, of course, we invite our, our uh, academic network to come and then research what is, what, what effect, what is the impact or effect if this road happened in, in this area or something like that. So this is a, um, I think we learn more, we gain more experience, we, 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 we gain more the knowledge with the road because of the road. So it's make us uh, in the beginning, because of the road, it's make us stupid, but because of the road, it makes us more clever to know how to reject and to know how to receive. No, this That's is awesome. a, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, you. Think, I think you raised like really important, really important points, Chi. Like, uh, I think what, what's staying with me in particular is this idea that like rejecting this kind of paradigm of development um, is not necessarily an isolationist stance, right? It's not a. It's not. It's not an insistence on a kind of isolating oneself from the world mm -hmm. or disconnecting from the world, which I think is a really important thing to emphasize. Yeah, Lisa, can I invite you to, um, if you have some thoughts to share with us on that that question, um, uh, which was a long time ago, and I'm happy to repeat it if if necessary. No, thank you. Um, I'm feeling very convicted by Chi that I am a white chicken, <laughs> which I am, of course I am. Um, I, it's really interesting where I do my field work, there's been a great deal of damage um, because of the war, because of the Khmer Rouge, because of the fighting after the war. Um, people from the mountain village, the mountain villages are people who have survived incredible, incredible damage. Um, and they're also people who are incredibly resilient. Um, so it, it is a great privilege to get to work with the elders on the mountain and hear their stories. Um, and I was thinking about your question and that people didn't protest the road. Um, they, they saw it as something that would make everyday life easier, particularly the women, there's only one clinic and now women must give birth in the clinic because traditional midwives have been banned. So everyone must get to this clinic and it used to be extremely dangerous to do so. And a lot of women would be in labor on the back of a motorbike being driven by a family member. So, you know, the road brings 
an easiness. But then of course, then it started to, you know, take lives, right? So it's suddenly another source of, of danger in lives on the mountain. Um, and just my, my second anecdote, I was, I was struck by how people incorporated the road into the landscape they already had, you know, it, that portion of the road was brought into the more than human landscape by asking this spirit to protect it. But even that, I think it's just important to point out, as people said to me, it's just that portion of the road. So one elderly village chief said to me, one of the issues of the road is the people who build it, they made a sacrifice, they asked the spirit at the bottom of the mountain. They didn't understand that a mountain is not does not belong to just one person or one spiritual force. He said, if you think of it like humans, we have different territories, different village chiefs. The road cut through many, many different portions of the landscape. So affected different people, different spirits, different uh, forces. And really they should have asked permission every step of the way. But as humans, we don't know, we can't see the unseen invisible lines of power and command. So instead, you have to know when you've made a mistake by when a problem happens, he said. But I found that really interesting that even Tassok, this spirit who was asked to come out of the forest, become the road guardian, he doesn't, he's not the only spirit that people make offerings to as they come up and down the mountain road. But that portion of the road, the people feel much better about now because it's become part of that that unseen landscape that particularly us white chicken types who come in from outside we don't know when we're crossing these invisible ley lines we have no idea we often don't see that landscape mm -hmm. because we don't know how to read it we don't know how to interpret it yeah. we just you know drive by so yeah thank you so much for that yeah um i really identify with that a lot too um i'm wondering like what kinds of roads i've crossed that you know, might and I might have been like crossing boundaries, cosmological boundaries that were unseen to me too. Um, I, there is a question from from the audience that I'd like to raise now. That's addressed to everyone. I think it's a great one. It's a simple but a powerful one. And the question is: Roads are expensive. Who pays for them? Mike should answer. Mike, I'll, please. I'll take a stab at this. Um, uh, for the for the previous question, I was going to talk a little bit about um, the funding of that northern economic corridor, but I think it's real. It's entirely relevant here because um, speaking about the, the the themes of complicity and reclaiming, one of the things that that my mind immediately went to um, was the ways in which consultants um, for development banks are often the ones who flag the problems but then who don't quite push back quite hard enough in order to get the mitigation packages big enough to deal with them. Um, and one of the things that was one part inspiring and probably two parts heartbreaking about watching that road get built was to see the language of activists who've been essentially fighting World Bank and regional development bank projects for 30 years um, on the impacts of infrastructure um, and to see the banks actually using the language of indirect impacts and um, cumulative impacts that activists have been using for a long time, but to only commit to addressing what they call direct impacts. Um, so essentially parrying that language about the more complex or maybe let, not that complex, but basically all the land deals that were going to come into that road corridor right outside the 50 meter mark um, and essentially usher in the land grab that a lot of the consultants who had been hired by the ADB to talk about the social impacts of the road had predicted. Um, and so the, I think the thing that, the way that that was done was using, you know, essentially a conjured calculation of an imagined internal rate of return that this project would have. Um, and so in terms of, uh, there's on the one hand, this dance between the banks themselves and the borrowers um, in terms of how much these roads are gonna cost. And I definitely heard from um, people who were working for the bank either as consult, I think more like as consultants than as direct staff, but 
that the governments aren't interested in borrowing for mitigation. They only want to borrow for the hardware. So they were essentially recognized this pro recognizing the problem of mitigation is expensive, um, but blaming the lack of mitigation resources on somebody else. Um, and that was pretty difficult to see. Um, I think there, uh, so that, that's a one part answer is that the, the governments um, are paying for this in sort of monetary terms, um, but ultimately the various subsets of the population are, pay are paying for the material costs of the road that aren't being financed in the mitigation packages via the add-on effects. Um, and at the, the second part of the answer, I would say um, it just in, in quick terms is that a lot of the smaller roads that are built certainly in Laos, and I, would, I think in, in Cambodia, there's some of this as well and possibly elsewhere, um, is uh, roads that are built by uh, private construction companies through resource concessions, um, essentially for the access to the timber along the route. Um, and that kinds of, those are the kinds of things where, you know, in the short term is sort of a, a dark spin on natural capital based financing. Um, but again, the, the communities and ecosystems that are proximate to those landscapes are the ones who ultimately pay for that materially. Um, so it seems like it's infrastructure for free, but it's actually not, it's just displaced cost. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I'd be really interested to hear if, if this is, is the case in all of the contexts that we're dealing with here, but I suspect that this is, this is a transnational kind of phenomenon that Mike is describing. I'll take this opportunity to actually ask another question um, from the audience. Um, and the question is, we're getting visions of so many different kinds of roads and the communities they gather around themselves. The ancient world was full of connecting roads and settlement patterns followed these. New roads through forests are qualitatively different from the older refurbished roads, um, uh, refurbished roads and the rivers as a means of transport. Can we talk about those differences in more detail from the different perspectives? I think that's a lovely um, broad question that really invites everyone to, to share with. Well, can I just uh, start off? Uh, one sure. of the things that I, I, one of the main, one of my main uh, research interests is on ecology. The ecology is also the risk uh, idea of development, which, which calls for a complete uh, transition away from the roads, the road network based uh, development. Because he identified roads and cars as the main cause of all these environmental problems that we have today. So the biggest problem, roads are necessary. And in the old, day, in the old world, there have been roads, but the roads are, roads are meant for uh, transporting, you know, for not only for movement, but for transporting material around. The big difference, the big problem with roads today is, you cannot get away from this, is closely tied in with population growth. As you have more people, the road expands. And when, you, when your road net, network expands, expand, what has to give way is nature. You cannot, so if you have road expansion, if roads in the current paradigm of road development, it is built on the ground. And as it expands, nature has to give way. So you, but that is only one paradigm. And that particular paradigm, the roads that we have today is directly linked it is based on cars if you move if you change your way of transport if you change your way of getting around you do not need roads yeah uh, why do you need to carry a lot of things with you i mean if you go shopping i really need a car because you know i can't take public transport because you have a lot of things to carry but why do you need to do that do you need to carry a lot of things with you all the time? But that is how we live today. It is a paradigm. The paradigm has to shift. So in ecology, the call is to move away from this and to develop in a more compact 3D miniaturized form, which is how nature does it. In nature, everything develops upwards and outwards, not spread out on the ground. So this is the, the whole idea of ecology. If you develop more in a compact form and away from the ground, then you, 
then you do not have the problem associated with the whole plethora of uh, environmental problems and climate problems that we have today. And you cannot run away from that effect. That outcome is inevitable because of population rise. Population will keep on growing. Towns become cities. Cities will become a huge <laughs> megapolis and, and nature will be replaced, displaced. That's truly so paradigm shift. Yeah, I, I love that, that sort of framing in terms of a paradigm shift. I can totally see that at play, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can we, I maybe invite maybe one more person to sh share their thoughts on this last question from the audience? Just very briefly, something that I have been learning on in the landscape where I work is that some of the landscape that is unseen to me is people, the word plow is used not just for the human roads, it's also used for the animal paths, the game trails, and <clears throat> what's interesting on the mountain is that the large animals are mostly gone because of humans, uh, particularly hunting and po poaching, um, mostly for lowlanders, not the people on the mountain, long story. But um, places like where the wild elephants used to walk, these are still considered roads and humans aren't allowed to build over them, to build across them, to dwell on them. Those have to be sort of kept almost like this memory in the landscape of what was there. And then there's also ancient Angkorian roads. Same thing, people may use them, but you can't build on them. You can't settle on them. So there's sort of this way of paying homage to the past in these old roads. And then I found out that people say there's water roads, but they're um, spirit canals. So they can't be seen. They're not current built by human waterways, <clears throat> but they're there and they're used by the invisible world. So I started to realize how many kinds of roads were in this landscape that as an outsider, as a white chicken, I, I completely didn't see or know about. Um, the only roads that I see are the ones that the humans made and the humans are using right now in the present. So I just found that very interesting. The people who live in the place know the ways and the, the landscape in ways that the outsider never, never does perhaps. That's sure great. That's that's really great. Those are really great points to um, to, to wrap up. We're unfortunately getting close to, to time here. Um, it really just goes to show like how rich this conversation is and, and how generative generative it is to to bring folks from various different parts from the different parts of Southeast Asia, different topographies, different cultural contexts, different historical backgrounds. Um, and different approaches to this research um, in, in having this conversation. Um, I'd like to announce that actually taking off on a lot of points that Gabrielle mentioned, um, the next webinar series is about discussing development, dams, and rivers. Uh, so I'd like to invite everyone who's here today to please join us um, for that conversation on dams and rivers. It's gonna take place um, November 24 or 25, depending on where you are, uh, at 3 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Um, so please um, keep a lookout for that. Mark it on your calendars. We'd be looking forward to seeing you there. Um, and um, another reminder that there is a survey that will uh, help us, help the organizers to um, continue putting on events like this. So please, if you have a second, click that link before the, the Zoom meeting closes. Uh, and please fill out that survey. It would be very helpful uh, for, the, um, for the organizers. So with that, I'd like to thank um, our esteemed panelists uh, for joining us here today. Uh, it's been a really wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you all so much. And thank you to those in the audience for joining us from wherever you are in, in the world. Uh, and to be continued, see you again very soon. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.